everybody. Welcome to our last uh, Boyhood School Public Service Perspectives of the Year. Um, just like the housekeeping stuff, uh, keep yourself muted if you're online until the end. We welcome questions in the chat or we'll do Q&A at the end. Um, I am lucky to uh, be able to introduce our, um, our guest speaker today, uh, Christine Daly. I was lucky enough to, um, to meet her this summer at a, the American Society of Reclamation Sciences conference where we got to have a great conversation about this idea of co-developing reclamation with the community and how that community needs to be part of that process from the very beginning. And I think that that's a lesson that is really important in so many different things that we do. And I was so excited that she agreed to come and talk to us this semester. So I'm going to pass it off to her. I'm gonna move this Zoom box out of the way. Um, but uh, thank you so much for being here, Christine. Um, I'm gonna get out of the way and, um, and uh, hand it over to you. Okay, thanks, Natalie. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give uh, a bit of a story within a story. I'm gonna, share my PhD uh, research um, project and also kind of embed it within my overall sustainability journey and, and have some of my perspectives on sustainability and my enclosure and reclamation have evolved um, with different experiences. Um, I would like to start out, uh, since my PhD is working really closely uh, with the First Nation, um, I was taught it's important to start by acknowledging the traditional territory that you're located on. So today I'm joining you from Calgary in Canada. And Calgary is a traditional, um, the land where Calgary is today is the traditional territory of the Treaty 7 Nations in Southern Alberta. And it's also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Uh, if I got this right, uh, the Ohio University is on the ancestral lands of the Adena, the Hopewell, the Osage, and Shawnee. And um, I just like to acknowledge that uh, I have an ongoing responsibility to protect, protect and honor all of life within our shared reality, as we say here um, in Calgary as treaty people uh, between the Indigenous and non-Indigenous people here. So I'm teaching a, an intro to sustainability course at the University of Calgary this term. And on the first day of class, um, to introduce ourselves, we use this river of life um, activity. And we, well, I asked ask the students, um, if your sustainability journey took the shape of a river, what would that shape look like? And who has um, influenced your sustainability journey? What world or regional events have shaped it? Um, what experiences have uh, brought new insights into your journey? And so here's kind of a bit of an illustration of uh, my sustainability journey. I, I grew up not too far from uh, where you're located. I grew up in southwestern Ontario um, in Tecumseh, right by the Windsor-Detroit border. And I was surrounded by, you know, the Great Lakes and coastal wetlands. And my early education uh, through high school, university co-op and internship opportunities and, and my um, degrees focused on the environmental side. Um, so I have a bachelor in environmental science, uh, and I also have a master's in biology that focused on wetland reclamation. Um, that master's project, that actually brought me uh, out to the um, Athabasca oil sands, or the tar sands, um, for those of you that have heard of it. So while I grew up here, and I met Natalie at the conference here in Duluth. Um, my master's brought me out to Alberta. And I'm currently now at the University of Calgary. <laughs> um, and when I, when I went out to Alberta for, for my master's, I, I made a lot of connections. I, I worked on wetland food webs. And um, I got to see the perspective of, of how um, 
the different components in a wetland are really interconnected from the frogs, the people that were studying the fish or the bacteria, uh, the plants, the soil, the water quality. And it really started, it, it really um, encouraged me to look at the relationships between everything and the environment. And because of those connections, I eventually got a, a full-time job working as a reclamation specialist for the oil sands industry. And I got to work on some really great projects, um, designing different types of wetlands, uh, marsh wetlands, uh, those peat accumulating wetlands, like uh, known as fen or bog peatlands, and a lot of uh, revegetation work and some conservation work on species at risk too. A lot of great experiences there, but um, there are some external factors that were starting to influence my perspective on sustainable landscapes, sustainable reclamation. Um, around 2017, after I attended the social innovation workshop and also um, the Truth and Reconciliation um, initiative in Canada around that time, I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. But um, the topic of reconciliation with Indigenous people in the areas I was working and living was something that was a bit foreign to me. And I um, wanted to understand it better because the company I was working for, they had a goal to build better relationships um, with the local community, including the Indigenous local Indigenous communities there, of which there were several. So that resulted in me going back to school um, to pursue a PhD where I wanted to look at collaborative reclamation practices, um, a two roads approach, bringing the best of um, reclamation science, uh, our Western science and indigenous knowledge and perspectives into uh, planning for uh, closing out a mine after it was complete or reclaiming the landscape. And I did that in partnership with the community of Fort Mackay First Nation. So um, uh, just for a little context uh, about the rights of Indigenous people that I was trying to come to better understand on this learning journey of mine, I'm going to introduce a, a few things. The first is about the Convention of Biodiversity uh, that came out in um, what was it, 1992, the United Nations produced it. And in one of its articles, Article 8J, it talks about the importance of respecting, preserving, and maintaining Indigenous knowledge and supporting traditional um, practices that uh, because Indigenous communities are dependent on the biological diversity in, in their traditional lands and waters, and that because of their sustainable um, worldview, that they have a unique role in conserving life on earth. So the United Nations said it was important to, um, you know, conserve the biodiversity that supports those communities uh, and also to enhance the capacities of those Indigenous communities to be effectively and ethically involved in decision making that affects um, their lands and waters. And so in the uh, oil sands area where I was working, there was a multi-stakeholder group that um, uh, wanted to dive more deeply into adopting uh, the Convention of Biodiversity in our region, in our industry. And so there was a number of Indigenous uh, communities, uh, the government of Canada, the provincial government, and a number of the oil sands companies that participated on this multi-stakeholder group called CIMA, or the Cumulative Env Environmental Management Association. And they came up with a biodiversity traditional knowledge study that looked at the current system and looked at the regulations, looked at the reclamation guidelines that were supporting people like me to make planning decisions about vegetation, wildlife, soils, and what the study found was that there was a lack of meaningful participation and involvement of uh, the local communities, in particular indigenous communities in the reclamation guidelines and the regulations. They weren't part of the process. 
um, in any significant way. And so this project came up with an approach or a methodology called the two roads approach. Um, and it's meant to bring the best of both worlds together into planning. And they also had these 17 recommendations on how to continue to advance this type of work. And my PhD project is building off of this study, the uh, biodiversity T TK study. Um, something else happening around the world. Have, have any of you, uh, maybe just show of hands or uh, online or in the class, have you heard of UNDRIP or the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples? Okay, so new, newer topic. Um, so in 2008, this um, legal framework, inter international legal framework was put out there. It's soft law, you, you, you could call it. And it, it's basically outlining um, the minimum standards for human rights of Indigenous peoples around the world. And it's a roadmap that countries can use if um, they want to advance reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in their country. And so it has these 46 articles that talk about different things you can do to ad advance um, working together and building better relationships. And Canada um, adopted this into our legislation um, starting around 2016, and we're still rolling out the legislation across our provinces and territories. Uh, but as a result of this um, international movement, our country started to think more deeply about our, our specific regional or national issues um, in terms of uh, the relationships between our, our different peoples here. And they produced, as a result, a truth and reconciliation. Uh, um, the truth and the, the government came up with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, and looking into the the challenges and opportunities, they put together ninety four calls to action for our country. And one of those calls to action focuses on um, corporate Canada. Uh, co um, companies or industries like um, the mining, the energy industry across our country. And this is exactly why the company I was working for at the time started to ask questions like, how can we build better relationships with the local Indigenous communities and across all of our business, including reclamation? Um, how can we have better engagement and consultation? Uh, how can we ensure there's long-term benefits for our economic development that last long after we're gone? And, and how can we support training and, and competencies in our staff? And so that's where I went back to school. I partnered with um, uh, uh, one of the, the most affected First Nations in the oil sands industry, and we wanted to explore reclamation together. So up here in Northern Alberta, um, the white outline here is the Fort Mackay traditional territory. And back in 1967, when the oil sands industry started commercially extracting the oil from the sand under the ground, um, there was very little footprint. There was just one open pit mine at that time. Uh, this entire area is Fort Mackay's traditional territory, uh, but their home communities located here in the in the hamlet of Fort Mackay, and they also have some other reserve lands that um, uh, they also regularly frequent. Um, but you can see that just a few uh, decades later, you know, uh, I guess maybe five decades later or so. Um, there was a really rapid expansion of the oil sands mining, uh, which are the big green and red polygons. Um, over here, there's more like conventional oil and gas. We call it in situ projects. They're scattered. And the orange is kind of oil and gas exploration lines and pipelines and roads. So their traditional lands are highly fragmented. 
And now we know um, that there's international, national, and provincial human rights policies, laws, and calls to action um, that are meant to protect Fort Mackay's, what we call in legal terms, their Aboriginal treaty and land use rights within their whole traditional territory. But as I told you before, the um, biodiversity study found that Fort Mackay is not being involved in, in uh, through policy, through the uh, project specific regulations or through the government recommended reclamation guidelines. Uh, and this is just a few photos so that you can see um, what an open pit mine looks like here. Uh, this is the oil being extracted from the sand or oil sands being extracted. And then the, the oil is sent by pipelines to like a, an extraction facility here where they separate the oil from the sand using hot water. And you can see across the river here, there's a little river, it's hard to see, but there's actually a former tailings pond here um, that shows part of the reclamation uh, on one of the slopes here. And this is actually the surface of that tailings pond. And I had um, I was really fortunate uh, to be able to be involved in designing the marsh wetland and, and the rivers and swales on the surface of that tailings pond. So naturally, there are very few of these little marshes in, in the region, but there is a lot um, of peatlands, bogs and fens, and um, about half of the landscape is, is wetlands, mostly this type of wetland. And then the rest is forest and there's some small lakes. And so Fort Mackay, um, you know, uh, the community I happen to be working with, they're very interested in the renewal of cultural landscapes, but depending on, you know, where a mine is located, um, the local communities might have different interests more in like, when the mine leaves, what are our economic opportunities? Where will our jobs be? Um, how will we pay for the city's infrastructure? Um, or it could be environmental. And in this case, it was cultural. <clears throat> so the goal of my uh, PhD was to explore and create <laughs> a participatory and inclusive approach to mine closure and reclamation that supports the renewal of cultural landscapes. And the, there is, while there's a call globally, and it's a best practice to work, um, like around the world, it's recognized with mining companies, you should work with the local communities that have to live uh, with the reclaimed landscape long after the companies go. But there's not a lot of tools out there to help um, companies and people with uh, the actual planning. So we decided to develop some ground rules on how we wanted to work together by creating a code of conduct. Um, we, it was important to, to us to create tools for co-reclamation, which was the name of our project, um, to support others to do this type of work. And we want to evaluate the current um, practices, how, how are companies currently planning for Fort Mackay's traditional land uses? And then lastly, we wanted to produce a framework, a kind of a visual tool to help companies and, and governments to, to know when and how to, uh, what key strategic points to engage with local communities, uh, Fort Mackay in particular in this situation. So we uh, adopted that two roads approach that the SEMA Biodiversity Traditional Knowledge Study created. Um, it was created with an ethno-ecological approach or framework um, where ethnoecology is just look, it's a discipline of anthropology that looks at how uh, people understand the relationships between humans, plants, animals, and, and the local environment. So by applying a two roads approach, uh, it basically helped us to, to think about and explore new reclamation processes that were developed based on how Fort Mackay understands their traditional lands, their water, and, and, and their, um, like their land-based knowledge system. So it welcomed in the local 
architects or experts, um, Fort Mackay as the boreal forest experts into leading, co-leading the research. We also um, early in the project worked with an oil sands company as reclamation experts. Um, and my old uh, mentor used to say, this is about the best of both worlds, creating space for plural or multiple ways of knowing. So the methods that I used, um, I, you know, someone that my background was in uh, natural sciences, ecology, reclamation, um, suddenly I was starting to explore and learn more about the social sciences and how to bring um, both into a project. So um, I applied ethnographic methods, uh, basically observing people, observing Fort Mackay, the company, to understand <clears throat> their experiences, their perspectives, um, their practices. And the data I had for the project was actually the dialogue and the stories from their conversations um, that was recorded with audio, video, notes, photos. And then I applied a really rigorous interpretive process where you would actually code this data and identify themes throughout, throughout the transcripts that were created. Um, another method I used um, to come up with a, our, our framework was, a um, our rec our co-reclamation framework was critical participatory action research and a method adopted from McKenzie at L2012, um, where we were using social learning and adaptive management in three recurring stages. Um, yeah, so the stages that I'm referring to are inquiry, action, and reflection. And because it's adaptive management, you're kind of always um, going back and trying to learn more and modify your research products um, so they get better and better over time. Uh, the inquiry part, I started by, you know, forming the relationships uh, with the community, with the company. Um, and, and doing a literature review and sharing what some of the best practices, impediments um, to meaningful Indigenous engagement and successful mind closure were. And the key things I found in the global literature is make sure when you're reclaiming a mine and closing it out, um, that you avoid public burden, that it's done right, you're not leaving contamination, that it's meeting the needs of of the public there um, so that you're not, the government's not gonna have to use public taxes to fix a disaster. Um, I talked a lot about the truth and reconciliation happening nationally here and internationally and how uh, Canadian en energy industry uh, was aspiring to earn trust in, in um, reclamation in their overall practices but that there is currently a huge mistrust in oil sands reclamation, um, especially with the local indigenous communities. And that best practices are to include local communities and not just the environmental aspects of reclamation, but the social, the cultural and the economic um, and to be adaptive. And that there's a lack of tools to support this kind of stuff. So based on um, these key results, we came up with a framework, our initial framework that we were going to test out. So it was our initial theoretical concept of, um, that involved, well, we need to come up with a diverse team of Indigenous and non-Indigenous people doing the planning. And then we got a line on having some shared objectives, a shared vision and ways of working or collaboration principles. Um, eventually we wanted to pick a, an area that was disturbed by mining and to come up with a reclamation plan together with the best of both knowledge sets. And eventually um, use that plan to reclaim the landscape and then to monitor it together. And another student, uh, master student in the project at the University of Waterloo, who was also partnering on this, she um, was focused on the collaborative monitoring stuff. And she also gave a presentation at uh, the conference where Natalie and I met. So the next step, once we had this framework guided by, um, you know, best practices and the state of knowledge and 
mine closure and reclamation research was to actually conduct the research, go through each of these steps and see if um, the theory is correct and could lead to mutually beneficial reclaimed landscapes with this proposed process or framework. And so what I'm gonna do from here on out is kind of walk through each of those um, steps in our proposed framework. The first, you know, was really about relationship building. Like once we developed this team of about a dozen uh, co-researchers from Fort Mackay First Nation, about a dozen from an oil sands company of reclamation experts, engineers, forest um, specialists, soil scientists, uh, and also uh, our academic team of which there was about a half dozen of us. So we spent time getting to know each other at first on the land and exploring Fort Mackay's um, traditional land use practices while at Moose Lake, one of the last intact areas in their traditional territory, um, doing fun activities. And then with the mutual, our focus on mutual learning, uh, we did reclamation tours at the company to explore um, their regulations, their practices. We also did a baseline survey to understand um, what principles people thought were important to working together, their hopes, what they thought barriers were. And um, once we kind of established, you know, uh, a, a bit of a, a relationship with one another, so a little bit of trust to be able to explore different ways of planning. Then we decided to come up with our code of conduct. Um, so we used, uh, again, a participatory action research method, but also storytelling and um, Fort Mackay's uh, talking circle a way of how they share ideas, where one person in a circle talks at a time. Uh, and so we asked um, all the co-researchers here to share stories uh, from their past, um, past experiences that were memorable uh, from past Indigenous engagement in energy development reclamation. And from those stories, uh, after listening to them, we kind of went into two talking circles and two or two subgroups and asked all the co-researchers to reflect on the stories they heard and to identify what they thought were important principles for working together after hearing barriers or things that worked well. And uh, so from those themes and principles and also from part of the baseline survey we did where co-researchers talked about important values, things like they thought it was important to be respectful with, to one another, to be open to new ways of knowing, to listen deeply, to embrace two ways of knowing. Um, but between those kind of um, the storytelling and the survey, co-researchers came up with 13 principles in our indigenized code of conduct um, that are presented here on a medicine wheel, which represents uh, Fort Mackay's way of viewing the world, which is through a medicine wheel that talks about different seasons and colors that are inherent to, to their culture. So spring, or um, this is in Cree, you'll notice it's in three different languages in some areas. There's Cree, there's English, and the green is actually Dene. Because uh, there's a couple, there's three languages spoken within the community, um, but it was important to start um, from their view on some foundational principles like uh, actioning, working together, being curious about the 50-year history and impacts on on uh, Fort Mackay, and and being open um, to new information. And so the idea is that as you you, that all co-researchers were meant to embrace these 13 principles and to practice them to get better at working uh, well together across an intercultural space so that we could more clearly communicate and be more proactive uh, together and build things that represent all of our knowledge and needs. Uh, and this is a really good example of that. 
Um, but if you work through the seasons and you start accumulating these principles, uh, things like in the fall, embracing two ways of knowing, two different knowledge systems, being open to being corrected and, and um, being curious about things, not always getting things right. Um, the hardest one I find for everyone is the winter season, or, or you might even say like, um, they also talk about this in age, like the life cycle of, of our ages. So in the winter time of our uh, elderhood, you could say, we were all encouraged to think about this, and this was really big for me, to, to think about the losses that Fort Mackay experienced. I always thought of reclamation as the great side, the positive side of the industry. We're bringing back forests and wetlands and biodiversity. But for the community to talk about um, reclamation, they had to think about everything that they had lost, the landscapes that were removed, the memories with their family on the land, their gathering places, and that it actually brings out trauma for many of them each time we meet and talk about this. And that was really insightful. So they said it was important that we, we had space for their pain to come out where it was needed because it's hard for them to move forward and build trust with a company if they weren't willing to acknowledge the impacts that are still ongoing. And for those of you that are familiar with the Society of, Society of Ecological Restoration, um, one of their publications agrees that it's in, that responsible, respectful restoration uh, can only be achieved with shared principles and an ethical code of conduct for a traditional knowledge partnership, something like this. I'm glad they agreed because it, for our project, we it 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 really um, made an impact on on uh, new insights into reclamation across different cultures. And when I talk about um, the losses and uh, acknowledging loss, it was things like an elder, uh, Edith, saying, you know, my uncle's cabin was once an area where our family gathered and we, had lots of, we have lots of memories there. Um, but now it's, uh, it's an oil sands mine and her kids and grandkids, they will never know what it was like to gather at that cabin and, and have holidays together and experiences. And so there's a lot of loss um, that is important to be aware of. And Fort Mackay uh, also taught us that, um, and this was a, re a really big um, insight, that reclaiming the land in partnership with them and other affected Indigenous communities is actually an act of reconciliation, which is something um, corporate Canada, uh, especially the energy industry and mining industry is interested in, in um, having like a, a reconciled relationships with these communities. I'll just kind of keep moving along here. Uh, within those stories that were be, being told in the talking circle, in addition to that code of conduct, which we call our cycle of respect, um, a story, an aspirational story emerged from everyone's micro stories. And that is um, something that was named, named by an elder uh, called Clara Mercer. She, she recognized that there was an interest to work together for the betterment of our people and the land, um, which in Cree is Te Mamano Aski Kikakio Asinawak and in Dene, um, it's Eta Ethalida Miha Tuha. And um, part of working together is, like I said, including, including uh, the peoples that are affected, their unique knowledges, so that we're reclaiming important elements of biodiversity for them. And it's also, um, they, they emphasize it's including their languages so that the communities aren't losing the languages, they're practicing it and passing that knowledge on to the next generations. So even though I'm not good and don't understand Cree and Dene, to them it's important that we highlight that. Um, it's also a best practice around the world for minds to come up with a shared vision 
with the local communities and government. And so using art, traditional shield artwork um, that you'll see here and storytelling and talking circles, um, the First Nation put forward their vision for the landscape, which uh, was about reclaiming the land as a form of reconciliation, asking the government and uh, companies to recognize the land and its original state, that they're the original people, the impacts that have been done. Um, and with this information, um, supporting the inclusion of their ceremony, their languages, their knowledge, and the best of the reclamation science um, to bring respect, understanding, and, and the land as best as it, it can be from those original conditions. Uh, we did publish this paper, so um, if you want to learn more about how to different cultural methods for coming up with a shared vision, um, you know, take a look at this paper. Uh, um, so much to talk about. <laughs> I'll just say an insight when we did the traditional shield art was uh, that there's different worldviews and priorities can create blind spots for us. There's things um, that I, I just can't see and know unless it's communicated to me because I didn't grow up in Fort Mackay's culture. Uh, I'm not Indigenous. Uh, so it was interesting, well, Fort Mackay and, and us researchers, we would talk about um, people using the land again, the company really being influenced by regulations, reclamation guidelines. They really only talked about the ecological return. Um, Fort Mackay would talk about the people, the cabins, the trails, the trap lines, the teepee, humans being back. Um, so it's interesting the economy there that just kind of provided evidence that reinforced that um, companies aren't thinking enough about uh, social needs, cultural needs. Um, I'll say every, I'm sure we can all appreciate that research never goes as planned. Uh, partway through my PhD, uh, during the pandemic, uh, the company stopped participating in the project so we can no longer reclaim a piece of land with them. And so instead we did a review of traditional land use um, in existing closure plans. Um, so different land uses, different plants and animals and activities, food needs, uh, harvesting. Um, and I'll do, go through this pretty pretty quickly here. But if you think about any document, in our case, we were talking about uh, uh, life, they call them life of mine closure plans, how, um, how a mine will be reclaimed over the life of the project and what it will look like at the end after the company moves away. So those documents, they're the physical traces of our social environment that have evidence of the way individual groups or organizations interact and represent themselves. So we did a document analysis um, where we evaluated 15 research questions that were of interest to Fort Mackay and uh, related to their traditional land uses. And we just searched, um, used search criteria and coding in the documents to, to understand their planning um, from a traditional land use perspective. We, uh, Fort Mackay gave us a subset of their uh, important um, culturally significant plants, birds, amphibians, fish. Uh, we got those from uh, their database, from uh, interviews, uh, et cetera. But it was also during the pandemic and for two years, I wasn't allowed uh, to go into the community for safety reasons. So um, there's way more species that we could have added, but this was just a subset. And what we basically found <clears throat> is that um, the companies do say that they are planning for traditional land use and that it's a target for, for some of the reclaimed lands and that communities like Fort Mackay were involved. They were at least shown the plans. They were involved in meetings. Um, uh, or most of, out of the seven companies, most of them involve Fort Mackay. 
And there's some evidence of their knowledge being incorporated into six out of the seven life of mind closure plans. But when we asked, was any of that knowledge, any other concerns um, used to inform new decisions in the plans? The answer was generally no. Out of all seven companies, there is very little evidence or no evidence or some in a few cases, um, but considering the 50, 60 year history, just a few um, things like, yes, we will plan for moose and beaver habitat seems pretty minimal compared to the massive uh, footprint and history of disturbance here. Uh, so uh, just for, for more examples, if we looked at the mammals in the area, the oil sands industry was planning for about 22% of those um, 49 species that were we looked at. Um, and they're generally the driver for that was the reclamation planning guidance put out by the government that say you only need to include up to 14 priority species or guilds. So there's lots of um, small mammals, um, medium-sized mammals like porcupine, and especially the large range species, some that are at risk like cougar, wolverine, woodland caribou that aren't being planned, their habitat's not being planned for. And that's a concern for Fort Mackay. Um, similarly, we saw the same trends in the vegetation. They're not planning for peatlands. So there's so many plants that traditional medicines, food items that aren't being included in the uh, future of the landscape. And we just saw this across all of the um, the taxa that we looked at, just very planning for low biocultural or biodiversity. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, 15 minutes left here. I want to make sure there's time for questions. <clears throat> the last stage was reflection and reflecting on what we learned throughout the process, what we learned from trying to implement our proposed framework. And um, a theme we heard a lot in part because we used a two roads approach was trails. Um, uh, one of the elders talked about the old, old their old trails that they've walked for, for generations have been destroyed and um, it's important for them in their healing journey and passing on knowledge that they're able to continue to walk those trails and share their lessons um, and creating space for other ways of knowing. Uh, Jean here, when communicating um, her perspective on the cycle of respect said, a lot of times we get pushed into a separate way of thinking, a Western way that's not theirs. And they want to walk their own way, bring their own values, their own ideas to certain points along their along a parallel trail, if you will. And that's what influenced our final recommendation, um, our two roads reclamation and reconciliation framework. Um, you know, we we said it's important to grow the relationship first, to have time together to have your code of conduct on how you're gonna to work together and overcome intercultural communication barriers and mistrust, for example. Um, we had great success building uh, um, a parallel vision at least, and um, but we know that there's a lot of gaps and that we need to continue to build traditional land use planning tools, a guideline is our recommendation that includes Fort Mackay and their knowledge in the planning alongside um, reclamation science, Western science. Our framework wasn't fully validated because the company stopped participating. We hope one day other, another company will try to reclaim the land and, and let us know if that's achievable with a community. Um, and uh, one thing we learned uh, especially seeing the company walk away and how Fort Mackay's um, recommendations that they put out there for decades continue to not be included in the planning decisions, that it's important for um, project-specific law policy to, to be created to include Fort Mackay. 
and to, to support skill and knowledge development um, on all sides of, of, I guess, the roads, if you will, in government, um, in, in industries. So, so like by providing things like training modules so that we know how to better work together across cultures. And uh, Alex and I both learned, uh, the other student, that to support cultural, cultural continuity, we, we can't keep Fort Mackay separated from their traditional lands through fences um, and gates for a half century or a century. Um, they need to be on their traditional land monitoring reclamation because it helps them to reconnect and steward their traditional lands. Um, so please, you know, let's include them in our um, shared monitoring plans and have Indigenous knowledge indicators. Uh, I'll just say a uh, key insight in my reclamation and sustainability journey is that landscapes um, aren't just environmental. They have, they connect the, they connect, the ecology is connected to our, um, our social networks. Uh, there's cultural elements. These are cultural landscapes too. We use them um, for, for different reasons. In Fort Mackay's case, for hunting, gathering, uh, uh, passing on their knowledge while they're on the land and um, reclaiming the land with them and not for them like I used to do. I used to make the planning decisions for them. It's an act of reconciliation and uh, Let's try and strive for the aspirational story, Fort Mackay industry story, to work together for the betterment of our people and our land by um, uh, adopting a partnership approach, by supporting the development of intercultural skills and knowledge and um, project-specific policy that aligns at the international, national, and provincial uh, uh, law levels that just haven't trickled into these projects for uh, some reason. And let's support more research in the area through multi-stakeholder forums and research chairs. So my sustainability journey is ongoing. <laughs> um, I, I now, you know, take the, the, the understanding that these are cultural, environmental, social, and economic landscapes moving forward and including all people that are affected by uh, planning decisions. But my journey is not done. <laughs> um, and I just want to acknowledge our funders, the, the community of Fort Mackay, uh, my research community that supported me. Um, uh, my uh, One of my supervisors that was a, a huge, um, had a huge impact on my learning journey. And uh, I've just left some publications and contact information if you want to reach out afterwards. So you can connect with me on LinkedIn, for example. Hi, I'm Dominic Stragman, a first year student in the Environmental Studies program here. Uh, thank you so much for this, for this work. Uh, indigenous uh, cultures and communities are something that I've been interested in for a long time. So, so to see this, this kind of uh, engaging and uh, and empowering work is is, uh, is really inspiring. Uh, my uh, my question to you is this: um, uh, the companies that that you were originally working with uh, before COVID, uh, did they give any specific reason as to why they did not want to continue the work during COVID? Because it would seem as though to me that this work could have continued uh, during such a time, if perhaps in another capacity. Yeah, their their answer was a little vague. Um, uh, it was something like we're just making difficult decisions during the pandemic and de uh, economic downturn. Um, but at the same time, they also continue to fund uh, lots of other reclamation research projects that weren't about Indigenous ways of knowing. So um, what they said generally was a bit vague, it just hard decisions. Um, but I think it was that just some leaders at the company were trying to hunker down during the downturn, not lose their jobs and didn't want to do things differently is more my personal opinion on that. Um, because, and, and I think it was a big loss because um, while it was maybe difficult to think about doing things in a different way, uh, asking experts to think, 
to um, maybe uh, evolve some of their practices. They, I don't think they really realized how um, empowering this was for the community and how much uh, trust it was building in them to be able to see their reclamation products um, being have the potential to be used in the industry. Uh, that that goes a long way to building their confidence if their knowledge is uh, returning the landscape. Sure, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm going to try to get a little closer. Did that decision affect the community's trust in you? I think it did. I think it did in that it probably strengthened our relationship and that I didn't give up, <laughs> which would have been really easy because to be to be really transparent, when they walked away, they took all their funding. And so suddenly I was halfway through my PhD. I had no funding, but the community of Fort Mackay provided their time in kind. They were no longer receiving honorariums to participate um, in the research. And, you know, some of the funding came out of, you know, to travel up there when I could, uh, were, were, you know, in some cases from my personal resources. Um, so I think it really strengthened our relationship in terms of like, you know, the commitment to doing the work when it was really hard and would have been easy for all of us just to say, well, I'll walk away, I won't finish my PhD. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to project. Uh, thank you very much, Christine. My name is Jeff Dubalco. I really appreciate your presentation. I see it having um, lots of lessons for the processes looking, well, it's not quite looking back at fossil fuels, but also looking forward in the mining needs for renewable energy technologies as well. So alas, these challenges are not going to go away, even if we have a successful green energy uh, transition. Absolutely. Is, is on the, um, you had the disappointment on the government, or on the business side. How has the reception uh, or lack thereof been from the government side at, on multiple levels? It strikes me that in a couple of instances, um, there were, uh, I think the, the, the number of animals that needed to be in the plan was was at a level set by government, not set arbitrarily by business, right? So there are ways to have some of these insights affect um, both the incentives and requirements that, that government can provide and play a positive role in this space? Yeah, that's a really great question. I um, So, you know, to be fair, we didn't ask uh, any government agency to be part of the project, only because because honestly, I thought it was going to be hard enough uh, working with uh, First Nation and a company that uh, had conflict. <laughs> so to introduce government where there's even more mistrust would have, yeah, I just want to start small. Um, <laughs> uh, but, um, it, you know, one of the, re uh, there's a lot of mistrust, I, I, I can say, from Fort McKay because of the existing regulations. And when you, when you think about it, they're like the provincial government, they are approving the reclamation plans um, that don't have, that, that say they're planning for traditional land use, but they have very little evidence in, in that they are. Yet the government, uh, the provincial government approved the plans and these are the ones that are being allowed to recreate the landscapes. So there's disappointment that even though there's national and provincial legislation that says uh, indigenous rights and their Fort Mackay's land use needs need to be included in the plans. The government's not actually enforcing their own law adequately. So we're trying to publish a lot, as you can see um, on the right, and, and we have um, more papers about to be submitted for publication. So we're trying to publish a lot, get this information out there, and we do want to have a, um, we, we do plan to set up a meeting to share some of our key lessons with government in, in hopes that uh, they might wanna work with Fort Mackay, maybe fund some work, uh, create a new traditional land use guideline or update guidelines. So it's our hope to influence action, maybe 
policy change um, or training. I mean, as a non-Indigenous person that has friends that work in the government, I, uh, you know, I have empathy for them. They haven't been trained on how to evaluate and plan for another culture's um, traditional land uses. So I think there's also an educational component that we need to be cognizant of. Yeah, we have time for probably one more question if anyone else wanted to. Great. If not, can everyone join me in thanking Christine for our time and this wonderful presentation? Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm just so happy to share this information and I hope it plants seeds in, uh, in your sustainability journeys and you start to think about the interconnections in our landscape with people and culture and, and economy a little differently. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. All right. Bye, everyone.